Okay, great. So uh, welcome to the YouTube channel, Teo. Really good to have you on board. And today you're going to be taking us through the work that you've been doing on adder optimizations. Uh, so maybe we can just start off by a little bit of introduction about you. Right. Well, first off, thanks a lot for having me here, Matt. It's uh, great to be on your YouTube channel. I'm really glad to be doing this talk with you. And uh, my name is Teo. I'm a uh, PhD candidate at Oklahoma State University. I'm doing computer engineering. My main area of research is that of uh, arithmetic logical synthesis. That is just taking arithmetic operations like addition, multiplication, whatever, and turning it into actual hardware that can run and be optimized. Of that, I'm specializing in addition right now, and that's what I'll be talking about today. And because of my research and my interactions with uh, the open source community, Tim Ansel heard about me, and due to that, I'm currently employed by Tim Ansel's team as well at Google. So I'm wearing two hats, one as a PhD candidate and one as a visiting student researcher at Google. And today, I'm just going to be talking about my research, how it relates to um, the general background of adder synthesis, and then how it can be used to advance the open source field of just in general open source hardware. Yeah, really exciting. Because um, one of the things that uh, really piqued my interest was when you uh, when you shared your slides with me. I didn't have any really realization about how important adders are in general purpose computing. I mean, it's kind of obvious in hindsight. And so <laughs> even fractional increases in performance uh, make a big difference. And the work that you're doing now stands to make a huge impact in the performance of open source silicon and FPGAs. So... Um, why don't we um, start off with your presentation? Yeah, let's get into that. So my research and presentation today is open about open source hardware edition, uh, specifically on Sky 130 in this case. And just a quick outline, it's going to be about 40 minutes, give or take. About 10 minutes is going to be the introduction and the motivation, why adders are important, why I've been spending so much time in my life researching this stuff. About 10 minutes about hardware implementations of uh, edition. Another 10 minutes about adder trees. I'll get into what that means later and how to optimize them. And then we can have a little uh, demo and discussion of just some uh, cool things I've made. So motivation, uh, addition is a really important hardware operation. Um, I have, for example, a uh, RISC-V processor uh, built in a Verilog lying around that boots into Linux. And I've done a dump of uh, the instructions. Whenever it boots into Linux, about 65% to 72% of its assembly instructions use addition. That's a lot, that's really important. And why does that happen? Because basically all arithmetic operations are built off of addition. Subtraction is just addition of a negative number. Multiplication is repeat addition, et cetera, et cetera. And even things like incrementing a program counter inside a processor, that's modified addition as well. If you don't believe me that addition is important, just go on Google and search RISC-V GitHub Diagram. This is the first result I found when I did such a uh, search, and this just shows a breakdown of a RISC-V processor across multiple stages. And just let's go through in here really quick and just show that addition is everywhere. Right here, you got this plus four on the program counter. That's an adder, a modified adder, sure, but it's still an adder that can be optimized the way I'm going to present in these slides. Over here, you got another plus four, or another adder. Over here in the execution stage, obviously you're gonna have adders when you're executing stuff. You have your LU, that's basically a big adder with some stuff on the side. You got multiply divide, that's a bunch of adders. And just throughout all of these sub blocks, there's also hidden little adders hiding here and there that might not be you know, the full word with. But the point is addition is ubiquitous. It's uh, everywhere. It's in almost every stage of a processor design. And usually it's on the critical path, which means it needs to be made optimal. So, designing an adder involves trade-offs. There's no single optimal circuit. You can't just say, this is the best adder and plop it in. Instead, there's a Pareto front of optimal circuits where each one has a trade-off where it's better than the other ones at one specific thing. At this point, there's been about 60 odd years of research into adder design. And there's been about 20 years of proprietary tool. That's you know the tools you have to pay for, the very expensive commercial tools. Uh, development for arithmetic synthesis. Now the question is, can we catch up to this as an open source community? Can we surpass this? And just to show you a, a quick overview, this is basically, this is a graph of area versus delay of adder structures. I'm just gonna do a quick animation. This 
is your naive adder that people have known about since the um, beginning of time. This is what you do hand addition in elementary school. This is how you do it. And then this is some research over the years in the 60s, early 70s, and then early 80s, just to show you that it forms some kind of predoptimal front. But what's uh, interesting is not this as much, but let me go into some historical context. Let's go through this slide, which is progress in adder research along a timeline. And this is just publications that have been done until 2000 and such. You start off with a very basic adder, R for ripple carry, the uninteresting one, the one you learn about in elementary school. Okay. And then in 61 or 62, Sklansky publishes a paper. Now, uh, on this graph, this timeline, this is, um, I measured this with a ruler. So the timeline represents the actual amount of years in here. The ripple carry is off far to the left, but in general you will see. And then the progress I measured of actual performance. I went through and I implemented all these adders on this timeline. And for example, after Sklansky came Coggy Stone, who made a bit of progress, you can't see, but incremental progress on performance. And then Brent Kung, Hank Carlson. And then over here, we start getting into tool development where uh, this starts to be uh, decoupled from actual uh, hardware performance, but tool development is very important. But what I'm trying to show you here is just that there's this trend of progress in publications about adder research. And this is roughly how fast it's gone over the years from 1960 to the 2000s. Okay. Now, that was the progress of publications and uh, closed source proprietary tools. Now, what about the open source domain? I'm going to start this timeline with the release of Yosis. A short while after Yosis was released, uh, Claire introduced uh, a parallel adder into Yosis, which was much faster than a naive serial implementation. Some time passed, and eventually my boss, Tim Ansel, came onto the scene, recruited me, and decided to invest into this idea of fast adder synthesis. And well, this is how progress since then. This mark free right here is today, or actually to be specific, last week. Now, um, those two graphs might not make a lot of sense separate, but when you put them together, you see a clear pattern. This was a progression of publications and literature and closed source commercial tools. And this is the open source progression. As you can see, open source is much faster. We've uh, reached basically the same point as proprietary tools in a much shorter time span, and hopefully we can surpass them soon. Now, these are all points on a graph. You might not believe me. I have publicly available results. I generate them using an open flame flow that I have in my repository here. I have scripts that automatically output CSV data, store them inside a Google Sheet, which is publicly viewable, where I have a history of uh, results over the last few months as I've been developing this. And I have an interactive open source synthesis and tool placed around a notebook as well, where anyone can go in and just mess with adders, make their own structure, and run openly inside a browser, get implementation results, numbers, layout, etc. I'd like to just interject here because I think that this is like a, a really um, interesting part, the, the collabs. So this is work mm -hmm. that uh, Proppy has done. Mm -hmm. um, getting the open source tools and the the pdk on the cloud and mm -hmm. i think this is it's re it was really cool to see your work leveraging the work that he's done and i think that this is going to be a very interesting way of um progressing the open source tools in the future do you have any thoughts on that what was it like to use that i absolutely agree with that i think it's a great tool moving forward uh, i'm going to i think at the end of this presentation if we have time we can do a quick demo go through it but no I, i'm very excited about it because it allows anyone to just get on and mess with it without having to download or install tools or anything like that and uh, i think it will really accelerate the development of just research in general i'm really excited to be part of it. i'm really excited to be a uh, close of property and able to uh, use this work yeah, so it kind of it meant that you could focus on the interesting part that you wanted to do and not have to deal with all the annoyance of getting the tools and the PDK and all that stuff set up. Yeah, exactly. Right. And once okay. that's set up, you know, once uh, probably and I make that happen, going forward, anyone that's interested in this kind of stuff can just jump in and they don't have to do all the grunt work because that's already been done for them. Great. Okay, sorry for interrupting. No problem. No, thank you, Matt. So just to uh, show some data sets, I have from that spreadsheet of historical results. I have some data sets from March, April, 
And then last week, just to show you, I was talking about Pareto fronts earlier. This is a Pareto front for March, this red line. Blue from April. This is a, a small improvement. I was trying something new. It helped a little, but not so much. And then later in April, I have this line. And basically the point here is that every time the line moves backwards towards smaller area or lower delay, that's good. And then another point here is you might notice on this graph, I have about four points for each uh, data set. Having a, a general way to just generate a bunch of points, a thousand points for uh, each data set would be really great because it would fill in this curve. And that's something I'm going to get in later today. And then you might notice here, this star, this is my marker for a proprietary tool benchmark, where I took the same adder design that I'm uh, trying to iterate on here. And I just told the proprietary tool to do A plus B on that adder width. This is where it's at. And you might notice that this mark right here from uh, last week, it beats the proprietary tool on delay. And that is where I want to head. That is where we're headed. This is the line that I hope to get out by the end of a month. I want to uh, get out a, a full spectrum of designs along this line. And we'll see how much further we can go beyond that. But the point is just that this development is advancing just over the last month or so. I've already got one point that beats a commercial tool. I can fill in this line, then we can start moving the line further backwards. And open source tools will be competitive or maybe even better than proprietary tools at this one thing. Just to show some tables, implementation results. I don't think we need to go into this sort of a presentation, especially since they're all online. I just want to show them off to you. And just a final layout of what you see. And you can also see this in the Google Cloud collab that I'm going to present at the end of this uh, talk. Now, one important uh, note to make is that the open source Skywater PDK comes with several cell libraries. And indeed, most PDKs do. You can even design your own for the open source one. And if you have access to proprietary tools or closed source ones, and the user can choose the library that best meets their needs. There's a high density library for good area. There's a high speed for speed. There's a medium speed that sacrifices speed but gets better power. If two libraries match in layout if they have matching cell heights, they can even be mixed and matched. So for example, you have these data sets where this is a high speed, this is a high density. Again, if I populate these in, it would be clearer but you have a rough line going like this between high speed and high density where you don't have to use cutting edge, really complex adder designs if you can just switch it over to library. Of course, that's not always possible. This is showing the same thing for power versus delay, but that's an idea to keep in mind. All right, now, so far, we've shown a motivation for adder development. It's everywhere. It's on the critical path of a lot of things that need to be made faster. We've shown a history of adder research and development, a preview of uh, open source progress so far and how it compares to proprietary tools. But what actually is a hardware adder? How does it work? Why is it complex? And how can it, how can it be made better? So getting into that, how do you add two numbers in hardware? Well, the same way you do anything in hardware. You make a truth table, you have your inputs, A and B, and then you have your output. This is just used to translate complicated logic into Boolean expressions that can implement hard. So let's go through this. Addition, zero plus zero, clearly it's zero, zero plus zero, zero plus one is one, one plus zero is one, one plus one. Well, here's the problem. Whenever you're adding numbers, multiple digits, one plus one is going to be zero on the smallest digit, and then you have an overflow, or also known as a carryout. What do you do with this overflow? In hardware though. And what you do with it is you have to realize that any pair of digits can cause an overflow. So that also means that any pair of digits might have to deal with a possible overflow coming into it, a possible carry-in. So given this knowledge, let's add two arbitrary digits. Just like before, you have A and B, your inputs, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0. I'm not going to go through this whole table. That's not the point. The point of this is that first, you can do it, but second, your carry-out. The overflow coming out of any pair of digits has a direct relation to carry in the overflow coming out of a previous pair of digits. Now, let's just show some uh, quick digital logic here. This is a sum logic. This is a logic to generate the sum bit. This is a logic to generate the carry bit. I'm showing here logical schematic, CMOS schematic, and then actual layout implementation. 
Now, going back to the earlier point, addition appears to be zero because each carry depends on the previous bits carry and the one before that and so on and so on. Well, let's just go for an example. How do you add 9999 plus 0001 in parallel? Can you do it digit by digit? Well, if you try, you get 9 plus 1 is 0. And in order for that, you discard because you can't do anything with it. 9 plus 0 is 9, 9 plus 0 is 9, etc. You can do this fully in parallel. You can instantiate six different hardware blocks to each one of these in parallel, get this in one time step, but the issue is that you get the wrong answer. You have to go from right to left. Just like this, accounting for a carry each step of way. Now, um, how do you fix this problem? Fortunately, there's a solution. You can just magically obtain the carry vector in some way, have some prior knowledge of exactly which pair of digits are going to overflow and which ones won't, and that turns A plus B into a fully parallel operation. Where now that you have this third vector here, you can do exactly what I said on the previous slide. You can instantiate six different logic blocks and just do 9 plus 1 plus 0 in parallel with 9 plus 0 plus 1 all the way up. You do all these steps in parallel. It takes you one single time unit, and you get now what is the correct answer to this problem. All of this are independent of the others. All you need is one time step. Now, the problem, of course, is that we're engineers, we're scientists, we're hardware designers. We don't have magic. So how do we generate this carry vector that tells you which bits are going to overflow? That ends up being the main thrust of research into adders. That's what makes adders complicated. And that's what makes adders have a wide landscape that can be optimized. So how do you do it? I won't spend too much time on this theory, but you use what is called a prefix sum. Prefix sum is just the concept of having a sequence where each member of the output depends on on input and all past outputs. It's a very theoretical concept and it's exactly what we need here because like we said earlier, each carry depends on all previous carries and you need to know the carry vector in order to have an accurate sum. Now, uh, prefix sums offer a very clear way of parallelizing any operation and that is, to follow a four-bit example, you just pair things off. You have, for example, here, this is a four-bit example where you have a prefix sum y3 is y2 and x3. It's all these previous inputs that came into it plus the new input. How do you parallelize this? Well, this is clearly serial right here, but if you know that this operator is square right here, is associative, you can draw parentheses. Now, this doesn't seem to help when you're just drawing this on paper. You still have to do all the operations, but a computer can take each one of these blocks inside of parentheses and do them parallel. And why free? You go from one, two, three operations to one block of operations, and then a second block. As you go up, this uh, benefit grows exponentially. Y7 goes from one, two, three, four, six operations. You block them off, and you do it in log of n. Long story short, this is how you generate good high-performance adders. And this is the landscape that you have to deal with. Now, just some uh, quick layout. This is a prefix operator for addition. I'm not going to get into a theory. It's too long and complicated, but it can be derived. It's a logical schematic, transistor schematic, and the layout. As you can see, it's fairly compact. It doesn't take a lot. It's not that complicated. That's what makes addition fast. So trade-offs. I talked about, OK, this is how you parallelize addition. The problem is, whenever you do it, there's trade-offs you're going to have. Any hardware design is going to have the following three trade-offs. Power, performance or speed, and area. There's no perfect circuit that can meet all of these, that can optimize for all of these. And just like that, there's no perfect adder that is the best at all three big things. The designer has to pick what the most important thing is to optimize. Sometimes that's low power, sometimes that's high speed. Most often, the optimal solution is a compromise. What do these trade-offs look like in adders? First off, fan out is an important thing. Driving more cells is slower. I show this here in this uh, spy simulation. We were talking about my uh, colleague, Proppy, from Google earlier, that set up uh, open source, uh, sorry, Colab notebooks open to anyone on the web where you can just run tools. I ran this in a very similar kind of notebook that he set up for me for spy simulations. But the important takeaway from here is this is a cell with fan out of one. This is the same cell with a fan out of four. You can see the input signal, how it triggers here. 
you can see how the output changes based on the input. And you can see that from fan out of one to fan out of four, the delay marked in blue increases greatly. In fact, at the halfway point here, I believe it was around 3.8 times. And just to clarify here, fan out means the number of cells that this cell is driving. Correct, yes. You can create a um, optimal adder based on this idea of fan out. You can turn this serial structure that goes one by one by one into the kind of idea I was talking about earlier, where you group things off with parentheses, you do them in groups of two, and then groups of groups of two, et cetera. But the problem is you have this fan out here, as I took this diagram from a previous slide, where this cell ends up driving four different cells, five if you count this one, whereas here your fan out is minimal. And as I showed on the previous slide, fan out increases delay. So while this reduces the number of steps you have to go through, you go from seven to only three, each step is slower. OK, well, what's another way to get past that? Do you have any idea of wire tracks? This is something else you can use in design. The problem with wire tracks is that cross-coupling capacitance is a factor, where if you have this kind of thing, where you have input and output, and you have parallel wires running between them, these parallel wires are actual physical wires in a layout. And the parasitic effects of the Maxwell equations say that the signal is going to be slower because of the presence of these parallel wires. And just to show you with uh, trees, with this kind of addition tree, again, you can go from this serial design to a fully parallel one, where you go from seven steps to only three. You can eliminate all fan out, but you still end up with wire tracks. OK, is there any way to get around both of these? The answer is yes. You can have a design that has no wire tracks or fan out. But the problem is you have to go for more steps to get to your final answer. And those are the basic trade-offs of adder design. You have to deal with layer count, how many steps you have to go through to get a final answer. You have to go deal with fan out, and you have to deal with tracks. All three of those slow down design. All three of those can add or remove area, add or remove power consumption. And what you end up with is a rich landscape where there's not just one single optimal adder, but there's many different structures that you have to choose between and optimize based on whatever your design might need the most. In 2000, uh, Dr. David Harris published a paper where he described this trade-off space as a three-dimensional matrix. And I'm not going to go over this diagram very much. I just want to show you his idea of you know, a three-dimensional space that I learned about and really liked and iterated upon her, where you have one axis that deals with fan out, one axis that deals with logic levels, one axis that deals with wire tracks. And as he shows in this with black dots being actual real designs along this uh, space, you can go further along one axis to have really high fan out or really low fan out, but only at the sacrifice of the other two axes. Now, that was Harris's work. What I propose is an exploration of the entire space using very simple point area transforms. We're at any point in the adder tree. I just transform between layer count, fan out, and tracks. I'm just going to show you what that ends up with. That results in this kind of animated GIF, uh, where you can go between all the different adder possible adder structures for a given bit width, just incrementally, one step at a time. Now, what this offers you is that if you have an adder that you implement in a hardware design, and it's just a little bit too slow, you can just go in here and just change one small thing about it, and all of a sudden it meets your specifications. It's just a little bit faster. You sacrifice something for it, but it meets your specifications. Whereas previously, with uh, the way that it was previously done in literature, what you would have to do if you're doing manual adder design is you have to pick between a certain set of available adders. That's the whole entire possibility space you have. You have no other options. And if you want something that's just a little bit faster, or very importantly, if one of your bits that comes out of your sum, let's say your fifth bit of your sum, use it to decide something, use it to feed into a decision tree somewhere, you make an if statement off it, you can make that one come out faster than the rest. And this kind of incremental approach allows for that. And I'm going to pause on this slide, get a drink of water. What I've talked about so far and what I'm showing here is a general framework for paralyzing pretty much any serial arithmetic operation. The only thing that's different between addition and, let's say, leading zero detection, or uh, comparing of two numbers, or uh, 
bunch of other operations is just this pre-processing logic and this post-processing logic here. The main body of a tree is the same and can be reused for different operations. So how can we optimize specifically for addition? Well, there's a few really cool ways that can be done. Every so far has been general query, but there's two big things that change the tree structure. Um, both of them take advantage of the same quirk, and that is that for addition, that post-processing node I was highlighting on the previous slide involves a four input gate, an XOR. Now, you might say tail, an XOR is a two input gate. It has A and B, you XOR them together, on the next slide, I'm going to show you a physical layout of why XOR appears to be a four input gate. It's not actually four inputs, but it acts in very many ways as one. In CMOS logic, which is the most common switching logic we use today, the multiplexer, basically the if then statement, the conditional statement, also has four inputs. It has an A, a B, and then the condition select, and it's negative variant. The main takeaway here is that this post-processing node of XOR has roughly the same footprint as a multiplexer, but the multiplexer has three inputs instead of two, which means that just by very simply popping off that XOR, popping in a multiplexer, you can process two separate options in parallel and pick the right one at the end. And just to show you really quick, this is the XOR, this is the multiplexer. They look very nearly identical. The only difference is what the identity of these pins are. And you can see here, you're saying XOR is a binary integration between two inputs. Yes, but in layout, you need to invert each one of these inputs, which takes time, which means that in the end, the delay and performance of the XOR gate acts very much like a four input gate. So you don't lose out on anything by just taking this out and swapping out for the mux, where instead of just A and B, you have A, B, and select the condition of the if statement. Just to show you inside a tree diagram, you know, you have your normal tree that I was showing you earlier, feeds into a post-processing node of one other input. You can feed it into a mux of two other inputs. Now, um, two main ways you can use this. First, as I was saying, you can calculate two different things and pre-select. What this ends up helping with is you, can, you have this idea of sparseness where you can pre-calculate two things and you can save on area by just reusing the same calculation over and over and feeding into this kind of thing. That saves area, that saves power. Another optimization is the link factorization, which says that for adders, this black box right here, this prefix operator that I haven't sunk into very much so far, it has a free input component. And I was just talking about how four input gates are inherently in a way sl slower than two input gates just because of their layout. Well, same thing goes for free input gates. So the idea here is to take one of those free inputs, split it off onto a parallel path. This reduces delay, but because now you're dealing with a parallel path, you increase area and power. You take one of these inputs, split off onto parallel path, can't show it in this diagram because the diagram style itself doesn't allow for it. And then you feed this into this mux in the post-processing node of an extra input, and you have an optimization. Just to show you, this is the normal black box versus the link one. You can see the link one is smaller, although that's not counting the actual logic you have to add up to the parallel path. And a simulation of normal black box versus the link out. Both of them I ran off a fan out of four, but just to show you, this is a free input operation. This is a two input operation. It's much faster. You can use it to speed up the critical path. There's uh, some of our hardware optimizations you can do that I'm going to breeze through because they're not as important. I want to get through to the demo. There's this concept of gray cells where you have a really big tree that's evaluating a sum. And then you realize that the bottom half of this tree, the bottom uh, row of this tree, it doesn't need as much logic on it. And basically all you do is trim off some of the logic because your final result doesn't need all this logic. On the very last operation, there's no need to generate a tuple, we only need a single result, so it's the same sum area. But what I want to get to, most of all, is the demonstrations, these uh, links, and um, if you're happy, Matt, I'm going to exit slideshow mode, and I'm going to go through some of these repos and notebooks and start to show them off. Sounds all great. Right. Um, I'm really looking forward to the demo, and it's worth saying as well that we can put a link down in the description, and you'll be able to Anyone who's watching the video is going to be able to click on that link and follow in the in the same footsteps, which I think is one of the really fantastic things about putting this stuff on the cloud and in inside these 
collaboratory notebooks. Mm -hmm. So take it away. This is a link to my main repository where I'm doing all this uh, research. I have about uh, 215 commits in main, about 80 more in the uh, development branch I'm working on. But just to show you, this is where I'm doing adder research. This is how I'm generating better adders. There's a readme. If anyone is interested, please feel free to jump on, contribute, raise issues, tell me why my stuff is bad and how I can make it better. I have a few uh, people tell me how to do that already, and I really appreciate their efforts. But this is just the main hub. And then another one, we have a Yosis plugin repository. That is a work in progress that I hope to uh, get in a publishable state in the next couple of weeks. Let me zoom in just so that it's easier to see. And what this is, is just a plugin for Yosis that does adder synthesis using my framework. And to show you really quickly what that entails is in your Verilog, you're writing HDL, you're trying to add two numbers for whatever reason. Instead of writing A plus B, you can write A plus and then put a Verilog attribute in here that just says use Teo's ideas, PP trees AOU, use whatever kind of structure you want as a base. You can add on extra transforms. I'm going to have some uh, shortcuts in here where you can just say, hey, make me a high speed or make me a low power adder. And it just goes through and using this plugin, implements it for Yosis. Hope to get that uh, in a publishable state right soon. Right now it's functional. I have this kind of demo working, but it's not very pretty. And I want to make it pretty before I publish it. Uh, that's bad. Another quick thing to show is the spreadsheet of results that I've been referencing in the first part of the presentation. And uh, just to show you some results, historical results I have here. For example, I have these tables where I compare the behavioral A plus B adder inside of Yosis with custom ones. You can see some of them are faster, some of them are slower, some of them are higher area, higher power. And again, the goal here is to have a historical record of improvements. I showed you in the early part of the presentation how there's improvements being made here. I want to show how things progress over time. And as my software grows and becomes more able, I'm going to print out a lot more structures here so I can fully populate that Pareto front and show all the possible trade-offs. And now finally, the coup de gras, the big one. This is something that Proppy from Google helped me put together. And it's a collab notebook that, again, is going to be linked in the description that does an open lane flow. It does first, you design an adder. Then you take it, synthesize it, and place it and route it through open lane. And just to explain it really quick, you have the setup portion first, where you install Conda, all the dependencies, clone open lane. This right here takes about 10, 15 minutes to run inside a browser because that's to download a lot of things. But once that's done, you have open lane installed, and you can just go through and use it inside a browser. Just to show you a quick uh, example, I have an example here where I generate classic adder structure. I have this adder tree right here that I generate using my library. You can see it's very quick code. And then I go through and I implement for open lane. I create a config file. I create open lane design. I run open lane. You can see here the logs, all the steps of open lane coming out. And then I have a final layout, which I can visualize, look at. I can take this GDS, do whatever I want with it. And I can view results. The results here right now is something I've made custom. It can be improved. But you can see from here that inside a browser, you can iterate. You can come up with any adder you want. You say, hey, I want to try making a faster adder or smaller adder or whatever. You can just go through, change it, take it for open lane, get the final layout, and then at the end, see, OK, this is 5.09 nanoseconds. That's the delay of this adder. And then if I have another adder here, you can go through to the end again here's like layout and say, okay, side by side. This custom one is 4.59. These ones are 4.46, 5.09, et cetera. Cool, I made a custom adder that's a little bit better than this one, a little bit slower than this one. And the attractive thing is here is that anyone can just get on this. They don't have to download anything. They don't need a lot of prior knowledge. They can just hit the install button and just start messing around with it and seeing what happens as you change different parameters and you implement this as a full ASIC flow for openly. And that's basically all I have, Matt. 
we can uh, talk some more about this uh, notebook, things that it enables. So thanks, Taylor. That was a really interesting uh, presentation. I'm really keen to see how this um, progresses and uh, very excited to try this out. I'm hoping that we can take some of your different ADA implementations and uh, tape them out in MPW6 so we can even get some characterization. That would be great. So if anyone's listening to this who wants to help with that, then uh, get in touch with one or both of us. And talking about getting in touch, how can people reach out to you, Teo, to make pull requests, to say hi, to get involved? Sure thing. So of course, as always, I have a public GitHub. So if you just get on that GitHub, you can raise issues. I'm constantly watching it. Anything you put on my GitHub, I'll be aware of and I'll respond. But just for a more general chatting, I do have a professional Twitter where you can reach me at any time. Matt will put in the description link. Um, and just feel free to reach out to me, talk about anything in general related to my work. I know that I mentioned earlier in uh, this presentation that I was going a little bit fast over a theory, not explaining the abstract mathematics as in detail. If you want to know about that, feel free to reach out to me. I have a lot of knowledge and I have a lot of material. I just didn't think it was appropriate for this particular time and place. Thanks again, Teo, and uh, looking forward to seeing where your work leads to. All right. Thank you, Matt. Have a great day. Cheers.